Welcome to my kitchen, and today we are going to make the perfect ham with my magical marsala glaze. A seductive, scrumptious sauce, a marsala applesauce. I'm going to show you to make sweet potato fondant. And we finish it with Brussels sprouts, with bacon, mamma mia, somebody hold me back, they're beautiful. Today I'm going to share with you my story, how hard it was to find a ham in February. Come for the recipes, stay for the stories. The making of a TV show is a fairly difficult endeavor, uh, not because it's difficult to make it, but because everything that you think is going to go your way actually never goes your way. Carissimi amici, benvenuti in cucina, my dearest friends, welcome to my kitchen. Today I'm going to show you how to make the perfect baked ham, a fantastic idea for your home parties, for your holiday parties, and get the family involved. Let me show you how to make it. We preheat the oven to 350 degrees, and now let me show you how to score the ham. I would like to tell you that this ham is an Italian recipe, but it's not. <laughs> I learned this here in America. I remember one of the first holiday parties I was invited to that they had this huge piece of ham just like this, and I said to myself, I need to learn how to do that. The one thing that we need to do beforehand is to score the ham. Why? Let me show you. This skin, as you can see, is very, very tough. So what I like to do using a very sharp knife like this, I like to score it all the way down like this, going down the skin. And the purpose of this is that when we'll create the glaze later on, one of the important part is that the glaze will leak into the flesh of the ham through these openings that we're doing. And then I'm gonna go across almost as if making a diamond pattern. There are two school of thoughts here. One is that you should be taking the skin of the ham off. I do not prefer that option. I've done it before, I like to keep it on top. It gives me the option to serve it to my guests because this skin becomes super crispy and super sweet. Some people even take it for dessert. So here I'm going to get a little bit more and I go across like this. Now, always be aware of where your blade is at. If you get too enthusiastic and go like this, you might cut yourself and I speak out of experience, I've done it myself. So very attentive on where you want to be. A few more cuts here at the top, in the back of it. Let's take this, let's move it aside. The baking dish that I'm going to use is rondeau. It's not an Italian word, it's a French word. It basically means the round pan, but it sounds so cool when you say French. <laughs> Two school of thoughts here. One is to put the ham directly into it and place it in the oven. I don't agree with the school of thought. Why? The ham is gonna let go of the juices. And even though we are cooking at a fairly gentle heat in the 350 range, when it goes to the bottom, it could cause flare up. So there's a trick that I've learned from many Sicilian dishes of the past. This is rock salt, the kind of salt that you use for making ice cream. And what we want to do is to put enough in the pan to cover the bottom of it. But why do we do that? It maintains its rock a like consistency all the way through the cook. Also what it does, it dissipates the juices that come from the ham, which they don't liquefy the salt, rather they harden up underneath and it prevents any kind of flare up. And for any kind of heat, anywhere between 350 and 450, especially with large roasts, this has been one of my favorite tricks always. So now we're ready to take the ham. We place it right inside our pot, as it is, like this. The oven is preheated, it's waiting for the ham to get in, and let's get started with it. And let me show you how easy it is to make a baked ham. I have a specific story about a ham. You see, I wanted to do a show about a ham. I thought it was a great idea, because the ham is not part of my Italian uh, background, and I discovered ham as a festive meal here in the United States. And I always wanted to learn how to do it. This one time I put my head to it. And it was right around the holidays. They had a little bit of a, after Thanksgiving. So there were hams everywhere. I mean, they were just kind of giving them away. I remember I finally came up with the idea of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to actually do a show about how to cook a ham and all the accoutrements that go with it. <laughs> I remember going to the store and there's only one ham left.
There is a secret to make the perfect ham, and the secret really is in the glaze. Today I'm going to show you how to make my version of the glaze, which contains a Sicilian wine, Marsala. This particular glaze will create a wonderful little crust outside of the ham and still penetrate with some fabulous flavor on the inside. You're going to love this. Let me show you how to make it. The ham is cooking in the oven, it'll be there for quite a while longer. This is the perfect time for us to make the glaze. Uh, when I make the glaze, I follow a rule because of a huge mistake that I made in the past. Notice how big this pan is, and also notice the shape that this pan has. It's almost shaped as a bowl. What this does for us, it prevents for the glaze as it cooks and it starts producing big, huge bubbles to spill over. I propose that whatever pan you use, you avoid something with straight walls like this, because what it will cause for you, especially on a smaller one like this, is for the glaze to spill over once it starts boiling. But let's get started. Let me show you how to do this, because this is very simple. I'm gonna crank up the heat up a little bit. I'm gonna start with the sugar. Together with sugar, we're gonna put our butter. The next thing we're going to do, and this is not an American way of doing it, this is Marsala. Marsala is Sicilian wine. Why do I do that? I do that because uh, it brings joy to me and it's a variation that uh, actually has a little bit of my own signature in it. Here is mustard. But why are we adding mustard? Well, there's so much sugar, we need to have something that is the yin and yang thing. And the mustard works wonderfully well in doing this. One of the things that I love about this technique is that all the ingredients go in at once. And here's going to be a mysterious ingredient for you as you've never seen it before. This is two cloves of garlic, which I have crushed. And I crush them because I want the flavor of the garlic to go on the inside of it as well. So here we go with that. What we have in here is honey. Honey is going to increase the sweetness of it, but it will bring in a different kind of sweetness, one that we will taste on our tongue in a fantastic way. And then there is vinegar. You can use any kind of vinegar you want. However, in my opinion, the best kind of vinegar to use is the apple cider vinegar. And here we go with this. And here we have some onions, white onions, super finely chopped. And what I'm trying to do is to create a combination that brings all these flavors out in a unique form, uh, rendering for us what I refer to often as the line in the middle. I call it the yellow line in the middle. I'm convinced that in everything that we cook and everything that we do in life, there's always one format that's the most revealing of them all. And this specifically is what I'm looking for. At this point, I'm gonna crank up the heat a little bit and you wanna stir this until this starts to boil and it starts to reduce. What we're trying to do, we're trying to evaporate as much as of the water that's in here from the liquid that we put with the vinegar and with the marsala. And then when we get down to the base of the sugar and the other ingredients, you want to see this uh, glistening and hardening up a little bit. In a certain way, you want to make almost a syrup-like consistency. And you can see right now the way in which it's behaving, that the sugar is going wild on the inside. As the water is evaporating because of the medium high heat we have it on, and it reduces, you see the wonderful syrupy consistency coming through. But you must always, and throughout the whole process, stir about like this. If you do not stir about, and the sugar is left at the bottom, untouched, it will actually burn. You wanna look at a time between eight to 10 minutes of continuously doing this and stirring. We're now at the point in which the glaze is ready. I turn it off. As the glaze is cooling off, I set myself up with this other pan right over here, and now I'll transfer it over. Ready? Let me show you. You can see from the darkness of it all, it has reduced to the perfect consistency. This is awesome. And there are the onions, the garlic, all these things that come together. The sugar, of course, you've seen that. The vinegar, the fights against the sugar and gives this sweet and tart finish to it. The mustard also has its own imprint in this whole thing. These are all flavors that are moving around and playing. This could be a sauce in the form and the way in which it is. But I will use this for coating the outside. And what I love as the end result that this particular uh, finishing touch does is that it creates almost like a hard crust on the outside of the ham, full of flavor of its own, but even a minimal amount of it will just jump inside your mouth as if it's a wonderful symphony, as if it's poetry. I know, I know, I look like a kid, forgive me. This thing is ready, the glaze is absolutely perfect. The next thing I wanna do is to look at the ham and see if the ham is ready now to take the glaze. Let's take a look. 
I have to tell you, the aroma is splendid. So the ham has now been in the oven for just about a couple of hours. We have about a, a roughly an hour left. This is the point where we want to put the glaze on. Now, putting on the glaze is something that we want to do every 20 minutes. And it's quite simple. I like to use a silicone brush because it allows me to really place it in such a fashion that gives me control. Also notice how loose is my glaze. One of the biggest mistakes that you could make is to make it so thick that it becomes hard. Remember, if you reduce the sugar too much, it hardens a lot. But look what a beautiful glistening that it takes. And this is really the painting part of it that I love the most. Making a ham, it's an artistic thing. And this is something that I just absolutely adore. All right, the glaze has been applied properly. And now we're gonna be doing this every 20 minutes until the ham has cooked completely. So let's take this back to the oven. I asked the guy, I said, excuse me, what are the other hams? There was tons of hams like that. Oh, we gave them all back. What do you mean you give them all back? I need a ham. Well, there's one in there. I need more. It's 12 pounds, he says to me. He says to me that. I'm looking at him and says, I need more than one ham. He says, I'm sorry, we have none. I'll be back next November. Mind you, this is now February. <laughs> what do you do? It's a good thing that my wife, uh, Nancy, she is indomitable. She has this astonishing energy and she made, must have been hundreds and hundreds of calls until finally somewhere up in Glendale. <laughs> <laughs> we find a store who still had a couple of hands. Well, if you know me, you know that I find a sauce for everything. And I have a fantastic sauce that I want to go along with this ham. It's made with marsala and apple juice. Even though many times I call the apple juice applesauce, it's incredible. Let me show you how to make it. I'm gonna start with some butter. Uh, unsalted butter is what I prefer. Uh, and the reason why I prefer unsalted butter is because I want for the ingredients to talk by themselves. The butter is at the perfect consistency, starting to bubbling up. And this is when we want to start our ingredients. First thing we do, our mirepoix. What is a mirepoix? A mirepoix, it's a French word for the Italian word soffritto. This is an iconic beginning for any soup, any sauce, uh, in which there's a certain amount of sophistication. Truly, all that it boils down to it is carrots, uh, celery, and onion. We just wanna cook this for a couple of moments, and here we go with the other ingredients. We're going to add now some bacon. Why bacon? I find the bacon brings to just about any sauce that I make, sometimes even fish sauces, an element that's totally unexpected. The smokiness of it, the beauty of it, and it gets along with just about everything. I lowered it now to medium. So you've seen the garlic. I'm starting right now to really identify the aroma of it. A little bit of time to give that wonderful addition that this herbs brings on to this. This is tomato sauce. Why? Why is it we put in tomato sauce in something that's going to go on top of ham? The guiding motion here is given by the base, which is right here before us. This is going to give an expansion to the flavor. It's going to give also a coloring to everything that will have this beautiful darkness to it. What I want to do at this point as I'm stirring, and it will be just for a couple of minutes, I want for this tomato sauce to coat the outside of every piece of vegetable that's in there, almost creating a small little crust. This will enhance the flavor of everything, but don't do it on high heat. Remember, when using copper, medium is good enough. Then the next thing that we do, is so it's apple juice, common apple juice. Here we go with this. The next thing we're going to do, and this is not an American way of doing it, this is marsala. And this is the most important part. The best stock to use, if you have access to it, is veal stock. If you don't, beef stock. Now we're gonna bring this to medium high, and you're gonna stir this until it reaches a rolling boil. Most of the copper pans in my collection are at least 20 to 40 years old, and I have a couple of them that are almost 110 and 115, and I love them. I can honestly feel the energy of all those chefs that came before me. We're getting now to the rolling boil. So at this point, once we reach this rolling boil, and you can see the bubbles moving all the way around, I stop stirring, and I reduce the heat down to low. And you're gonna let this simmer without a cover, without a cover, for a good 40 to 45 minutes. 
This is the ideal pan for the making of the sauce. And as you can see, most of the heat, as it slams against the walls, goes outward this way, but also at the same time, prevents the sauce from burning, and it gives it this gentle reduction over time. Let's let this sit now for the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll strain it. This is the part I love the most when it comes to making a sauce. The sauce has now acquired all the flavors that we wanted to give to and is commingled into a wonderful finish, but it's not done. We need to do two things to the sauce. We need to strain it first, and then we need to reduce it further and we'll thicken it up as well. One thing at a time. Let's start with the straining. What I'm doing right here, really, what I'm trying to do is to liberate as much as possible of the sauce. As you can see, all the elements that are given flavor to the sauce are here. So let me bring it back to the pan. Well, we have reduced the sauce by half. As you can see, there's lesser volume and the sauce has darkened in the process of doing so. Now, one last thing that I want to do is to thicken it up. The flavor is there, but we need to do a couple of things to get it exactly where we want to. What I have here, it's a slurry. A slurry is equal parts of uh, water in this particular case and cornstarch. What this does is that once it hits the hot, hot liquid underneath, it starts to expand and it thickens everything underneath without really impairing the flavor. The constant stirring is to make sure the lumps don't form. I'm gonna lower it down now. There it is. We got the sauce that we want. There's one last thing that we need to do and that is to taste the sauce, and we need to adjust for salt and pepper, which are the only things that I've not added. I quickly put my finger in here. Mm, the sauce is ready. We're going to move it here on the other side of the stove. We're gonna let the simmer for a bit longer just to keep it warm. The next thing I wanna do is to look at the ham and see if the ham is ready now. The ham has finished cooking. It's now resting, it's outside of the oven. We're cranking up the heat on the oven to 450 degrees because we need a much bigger heat in order to make this wonderful fondant with the sweet potatoes. So I went to the butcher and I asked for this particular cut that uh, is called rosetta. Rosetta is a piece of meat that only uh, exists in the hind legs of the animal and it's right at the joint when the leg comes into the hip. And it's a small, ugly piece of meat, but because of the enormous amount of blood circulation that comes through it, it's the tenderest part. And it takes ability to cut it out, and also takes ability to open it up, get all the filaments out, and just have it ready for the grill. <laughs> I remember I was, a, <laughs> I, was, I was a butcher in Palermo, and I asked him, do you have rosettas? And he looks at me and says, who's asking? The next thing I'm going to show you how to make is potato fondant, a very old classic recipe, but we're going to do it with sweet potatoes. Not only I show you how to cook it, but I also show you how to cut them and shape them in a very pretty shape. Let me show you how to make it. We need to shape the sweet potatoes. I'm gonna use two different knives. One is a Japanese type of knife. The style of this knife is known as kiritsuke and it's quite remarkable. Now, notice we have three pieces like this and the two edges. The two edges will do without, they do nothing for us. Now we need to shape this into the perfect shape. And if you can see, I'm doing it from the top and I'm basically cutting every piece out so we end up with a little rectangular piece like that. Why is this important for us? You see how this piece is completely different. It has a shape that's highly irregular. This kind of mandates a certain force regularity to it that ultimately will decorate. There's an enormous amount of waste, as you can see, but this is done because it's pretty. And this is the technique that I love to do for the fondants. These potatoes, unlike regular potatoes, have quite a bit of resiliency in everything that they do. So you need to have a very sharp knife to be able to get to this point. So these pieces are now gone. We get rid of the kiritsuke knife and we go with a simple paring knife. I'm taking right here the tip of the knife and I'm gonna bring it down as if I want to smooth this edge. Then I take it right again here, and I take it down as if I want to smooth this edge. Now here's a piece of the skin, and I take it down as if to smooth this edge. This is the last edge that's left untreated, and we'll do it again. And what we do is, we have this beautiful piece, as you can see how perfectly shaped it is. Starting from this, this is where it's gone to. OK, 
Okay, we cut all the pieces. Now we're ready to cook them, but we're gonna need a different pan, not this pan. Let me show you the exact technique that we're going to use to get this to the exact consistency that allows this particular recipe to be called a fondant. I've learned this actually from the, uh, southern, from the southern way of doing barbecue, where I've noticed that many times they always put some kind of oil or mustard on top of the protein to make the uh, spices stick. So in this particular case, what I'm using is a brush with some extra light olive oil. Now watch what happens as we add the spices. Onion powder, garlic powder, paprika, salt and pepper. And that's all that you really want to do. Not much more than this, but you want to cover it because the spices are going to give this wonderful flavor. Fondant is the name of a technique in which the potato is cooked by first creating a crust on the top of the potato piece, on the bottom of the potato piece, and they always have to be about this size. And then it's cooked in a pan until the crust is just about right. When you do this at home, you want to do this on medium heat. You're going to be on the range of 350 to 400, which is exactly what we want to do. We want to create a crust. Right now we're creating the crust in the bottom, then we'll turn it on the other side. What the crust will do for us, we'll kind of seal in all the flavors of what we're looking for. Now we're going to turn them and do this gently. Do not do it fast. The oil, if it splashes back, it will be a most unpleasant situation. But look how beautiful the crust is already. Before I add the stock, what I like to do is add butter to the pan, loaded with flavor. And now we go with beef stock. It's going to insert an injection of flavor into the potatoes that right now all that they know is the Stellino special rub. Now we're ready to actually place these potatoes into the oven that's reached the temperature that we want, 450 degrees. And we'll leave it in there for about 40 to 45 minutes. I say, oh, my name is Nick Stellino. My mom, her name is Massimiliana. I don't know her. I say, well, well you know me. I, I wonder if you could do it. I want to cook something special for my mom. She used to make it for us when we were kids. He says, no, I don't have any. And I see that in the back of him, there is the carcass of an animal hanging out. So I said to the man, what if I cut it out myself? I see it's in the back. The man says, ah, you're one of us. I say, yes. <laughs> he said, come back this afternoon. I'll have it for you. And that's how we became best friends. This next recipe is incredible. It features Brussels sprouts. For those of you who have tried them before, they're kind of odd, unless you cook them perfect. And when you cook them perfect, they are better than ice cream. In this particular recipe, we even put some bacon. It's awesome and it's very simple to make. Let me show you how to make it. All right. We already browned the bacon. Now the next thing that I want to do with the uh, Brussels sprouts that I cut in half is to parboil them. All that you need is about three to four minutes, and that will make it a lot quicker for us to cook it in the pan. I have the cast iron pan here in which I've left the oil in which I cooked the bacon, and in that oil we'll be actually cooking the Brussels sprouts. The Brussels sprouts are now being uh, parboiling for the best part of three minutes, and it's time for us to take them out. And I'll be using this instrument because there's quite a bit of water in the pan and I want to take advantage of this towel, not to absorb the water that's in the pan already, but rather to dry the Brussels sprouts that we have. Try to eliminate as much as the water. Don't push down, don't squeeze, don't break. Be gentle with everything that you do, exactly this way. Uh, there are two ways of, of going at this. One is to actually no parboil the Brussels sprouts and to cook it directly in the oven at 450 degrees. However, I find that I'm able to get the beautiful darkness that the oven generates on the cut part of the Brussels sprouts by actually using the cast iron pan. And then you want to turn it, and this is what I'm looking for. This to me is what really brings out the fantastic flavor. Remember, they had parboil now for quite a while. I mean, we kept them in there for three to four minutes, so they're somewhat soft already. But what I've done is I cooked them three minutes on this one side, and I'm gonna cook another three to four minutes on the other side, and they'll be done. Basically, we're ready to serve them at that point. That's why this is so easy to make, and it is so full of flavor. Plus, the mix that they will have with this is just awesome. Everything is ready. All that we need to do is to take out the fondant potatoes that finish cooking in the oven and carve the ham. And then, then we're ready to serve. To 
tell you that I'm moved by this is to tell you the truth. It's a brand new type of cuisine that I learned here in America and I found a way to make it extremely elegant. There is no reason why you cannot turn your own home into your favorite restaurant. And this plating, this plating is absolutely exceptional. And this, this is how you make baked ham with a marsala applesauce, sweet potato fondant, and Brussels sprouts with bacon. That's how we do at Vestellinos. And in this moment, without knowing why I wanted a piece of meat, this butcher did everything he could to make sure that my mom, for tomorrow's dinner, would have her meat exactly the way she wanted. And I did a fantastic job at it. And my mom gave me a big hug. And I like to remember that. Welcoming us to the kitchen for the first episode of the season. Smile, camera, action. Welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get blah, 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 yes. If usted quiere este prendere el maíz del usted ha de aspetar. La quiero de aspetar, por favor. Prende una tequila. Es muy buena. <laughs>